Hello and welcome to Lost Love Chronicles. Since the invention of the internet, life changed for most people. It got to a point where almost everyone I knew wanted a computer. We finally joined the computer generation a couple of years ago and broke down and bought one. At the beginning, it was the new toy in the house. Deb, my wife would use it for email and games. The kids, Kyle and Kayla, used it for games and some homework assignments. Me, I used it to search the web and look for spicy videos. That's what I did with a lot of my late nights after work. I worked the second shift and got off work from the factory at midnight. I didn't want to go to the bars like a lot of the guys. After all, I was married. So, I always headed for home. Everyone was sleeping, so I went on the computer. After a while, it was all the same stuff and became old. I really didn't become addicted like I hear a lot of people do. I went to these story sites and read stories about everything you can imagine. I couldn't believe most of what I was reading. Did people really do these things, or were they just fantasies? I found myself caught up in cheating wives' stories, all these women cheating on their husbands. It's kind of hard to believe, but it does put thoughts in your head. So, now here I was kind of watching my wife's actions. When we went out, I would mention to her about dancing too close or being too nice to different guys. We would actually argue about it. I knew she was a good-looking woman, but I had really no reason to distrust her. I found myself looking in the clothes hamper or looking at our emails. Just so stupid what comes to mind after reading these stories. I started reading less and less, but a lot of the thoughts were still there. I remember reading about men finding their wife with another man and standing there and watching them. I had to ask myself, would that actually be a turn on catching your spouse with another person? I kept thinking about it and, with my jealous attitude, I didn't feel it would be a turn on to me. I told Deb about these thoughts and she asked me why I would even think about things like that. She didn't want any other man but me. I met Deb when we were in our 20s. It was at her sister's wedding. We danced and became good friends after that. She told me she was a school teacher and I told her which factory I worked at. We started dating and were married about a year later. The following year we had Kyle and two years after that Kayla was born. Deb's sister Sandy was a wild one whom I met years before at school. We didn't date but she was pretty much a 304. I guess I shouldn't say that or I would be considered a 304 too. I was rather wild in my day too. She would have sex with just about anyone. As far as I know, almost every guy on our football team had been with her. I was part of an after-the-game gangbang that she was at. No one forced her, and she had done it more than once. She and one of her girlfriends, and, would have sex with almost everyone at the drop of a pair of pants. I knew her husband, Bob, from work. He was one of the supervisors on the day shift. He has since been transferred to another of our plants. He was about as wild as Sandy. He was the one who invited me to their wedding. I didn't much care for Bob because I knew the kind of guy he was. I liked him even less when I thought he was trying to hit on Deb after we got married. She told me that she thought he was just being nice since he was our brother-in-law but I knew better. I told her if he ever tried anything with her to let me know and I would knock him on his ass. She told me to lighten up. She was mine and only mine. We had agreed to never talk about our past relationships because we were both rather jealous people. I didn't want to go out some evening and come across some guy that she had mentioned having sex with. Also, I didn't want to explain to her that I had screwed her sister. When Kyle was eight and Kayla was six, they were both in school and Deb and I were getting along pretty well except for arguments that everyone has. We didn't get to see enough of each other, being on different shifts. I was alone during the day and she was alone with the kids at night. It was not the greatest situation for a marriage, but that was the way it was. One day, as Deb was getting ready for work, she asked me if I could stop by her sister Sandy's and fix her plumbing. Her kitchen sink was leaking and Bob was useless as a handyman. I laughed when she said the word plumbing and she quickly said, The sink's plumbing, not my sister's. If you ever try fixing hers, you'll be sorry. I told Deb I would stop by on my way to work and fix it before going in. She kissed me and then headed out with the kids to school. I couldn't help think about Sandy. I knew, from what Bob told me, that they were probably swingers. They didn't have any kids because Sandy always said it would ruin her figure. She did have a pretty good one, but wasn't any better than Deb's and Deb had two kids. Sandy has always tried to come on to me. I did my best to just kid around with her. She looked good, but wasn't worth losing my marriage over. I remember her telling me that someday it was going to happen. 
Sandy worked as a part-time cashier at one of the local grocery stores. She had the day off, knowing I would be by to fix the plumbing. When I got there, she had on a sexy robe. She offered me a cup of coffee, and we talked for a few minutes before she showed me the sink. I could tell it was just clogged as I removed everything from under the sink, so I could take the trap apart. Her husband surely could have fixed this. He probably didn't even try. I was on back with my head under the cabinet, putting the trap back in. She had put too many eggshells and potato peels in the disposal, and it clogged the drain. As I was putting it back together, she stood straddling me so I could glance up her robe. She didn't have any panties on and said she wanted me to screw her. I have to admit that the sight was great. Seeing a woman's privates is definitely a turn-on. I could feel myself getting hard as I looked up under her nightgown and robe. What are you doing, Sandy? I'm going to screw you. Do you like what you see? She reached down and touched the lump in my pants. Stop it, Sandy. I'm trying to finish this job. She backed away for a minute, and I finished putting the pipes together. When I got done and stood up, Sandy said, Are you going to screw me now? Sandy, no I can't do this. Deb is your sister and I love her. I won't cheat on her, especially with her sister. You screwed me in high school. Yes, I remember that hard tool of yours. Are you too good to screw me now? Sandy, please. I love Deb. She doesn't know about our past together unless you told her. You're a beautiful woman, but I love Deb. You foolish, foolish man. Either you screw me, or I'll tell Deb that you did anyway. She'll believe me. After all, I'm her sister. Why would you do that? Why hurt us? Deb's your sister and loves you. Sandy laughed. The prissy little sister of mine thinks she's a goody two-shoes. Well, we'll see how she reacts when I tell her about you screwing me. Sandy, don't do this. I'm not having sex with you, and I'll tell Deb about us in high school. I know she'll understand. I grabbed my tools and told her that her damn sink was done. I jumped in my truck and headed to work. My head was spinning. Would Sandy make up a story and lie to Deb? When I got to work, I called Deb but she wasn't home yet. I left a message, Deb, I love you and have something to tell you about your sister when I get home tonight. I went ahead and started doing my job. It was hard concentrating with this shit going through my mind. It started off as a normal day, just like any other day but now it was all mixed up. I called home again around 6, but no one answered. I called Deb's mom and asked if she knew where Deb was. She went out with Sandy and Bob. I have the kids here. Deb asked if I could watch them for a few hours while they went out. I told her I would just keep them for the night. I love having them here. Is there something the matter, Ray? No, everything's fine. If you see her, tell her I love her and will see her tonight. I have to get back to work. It was one of the longest nights in history for me. I knew I had to tell Deb about me and her sister. Hell, it was before I even met Deb. I'm sure she would understand. Finally my day was over and I headed home. I pulled in front of the house and saw there was a car in the driveway. I knew it was Sandy's. I guess it was time to face the music. I went to open the door and it was locked. I took out my key and couldn't believe what I saw. There in my living room was my wife, Bob and Sandy. Sandy was sitting on my couch holding Deb's hand. Bob was pulling up his pants. My beautiful wife was on the couch with her legs spread wide open. Everyone was startled as I opened the door. Sandy had a smile on her face and Bob had a shit-eating grin on his. My wife Debbie looked half-scared and drunk. Now I had to face reality. I don't know about the guys in the stories I read, but I did not have a hard-on. I did not like seeing my wife in this position. I was stark raving mad as I ran over to Bob and hit him as hard as I could. I knocked him down and started beating on him. Behind me I heard screaming. I didn't know if it was Deb or Sandy. I must have hit Bob a good five times before I felt a thud on the back of my head. When I woke up, I was in the hospital. I looked around and saw a man in uniform. Must be a town cop. I see you're back into the world. I'm Patrolman Gene Andrews. Where exactly am I and where's my wife? What happened to me? Slow down there, Mr. Harper. You have a concussion from being hit over the head with a glass face. It seems you got into a fight at your house and the police were called. You were to be charged with assault, but the charges were dropped. You're a very lucky man. You could have gone to prison for as much as 18 months. What about the assault on me? You said someone hit me over the head. According to the witnesses, you came home and started a fight with your brother-in-law. 
In order to get you to stop, his wife hit you over the head with the vase. You were only hit once, and it was to stop the fight. You should thank them for dropping the charges. Where was my wife when you got there? When we arrived, your wife was busy throwing up. Your sister-in-law said she had too much to drink, and you got mad at her, and, when you went toward her, your brother-in-law stopped you, and you starting fighting with him. All he did was try and protect himself. When we talked to your wife, she said she hardly remembered anything but you screaming at her. If the charges were dropped, then why are you here? My supervisor called while you were still out and told me to wait and get your statement. So, what happened? I have nothing to say. I wasn't about to tell the world that I caught my wife screwing another man. I just laid there and said nothing. Okay, then, have it your way. According to the doctor, you will have to be here till tomorrow. I suggest you think about what you did and thank God that no charges were filed. You're a very lucky man, Mr. Harper. The officer left, and I laid there with a terrible headache. What was I going to do next? I knew I couldn't live with a cheating wife, but I had to know why she did it. I called my sister to come pick me up the next morning. I didn't have any way to get to my house, and I sure the hell didn't want Debbie picking me up. While I was waiting for Amy, my sister, to come, the phone rang. It was Deb. Do you want me to come and pick you up? We need to talk now that we are even. Even? What the hell are you talking about? You screwed Bob and say we're even. I have Amy coming to pick me up. I just want to get a few of my things and I'll be leaving. What do you mean leaving? I just got even with you for what you did, replied Deb. I'm not talking about this over the phone. Amy and I will be by to pick up my things and we'll talk then. I hung up the phone and waited for Amy. She showed up a few minutes later and we headed to my house. I asked Amy to wait in the car. I knew she liked Deb and I didn't want her to be in the middle. I knocked on the door and Deb opened it. I asked where the kids were and she told me they were still at her mom's. I spoke first. Did you get my phone message? Yes, and Sandy told me how you forced sex on her. How could you do that? She was crying lightly. I did no such thing. That's why I left the message. I went to Sandy's and fixed her plumbing. She started coming on to me, and I told her no, but she kept pushing the issue. She told me she would tell you that she had sex with me even though she didn't. I don't believe you. You're lying. Why would my sister lie to me? She's jealous of our marriage. She wanted to see if she could break us up, and it looks like she succeeded. Why do you think she sat there and let Bob screw you? They're swingers and wanted to involve you, so you would screw Bob. It looks like they both got what they wanted. You let Bob screw you and our marriage is dead. No, it's not true. I did it to get even with you. You sexually assaulted my sister and I had sex with Bob to get even with you. Sandy even knew you were not circumcised and about the mole on your upper thigh. Your sister is a 304. The reason she knew that was because I screwed her in high school, along with every other guy. She would put out for any guy, usually more than one at a time. I never told you because I fell in love with you and didn't want to lose you. Then you said we would never talk about our past relationships and I put it all behind me. I don't know what to believe. Sandy's my sister. And I'm your husband. You couldn't even wait to ask me or call me about it. Instead you let Bob screwed you. Do you really think that would solve the problem if I assaulted your sister? You must have wanted him awfully bad to let them talk you into it. But, Sandy said, I don't give a rat's ass what your 304 of a sister said. It's not only you letting another man screw you. It's the not respecting me or trusting me to at least let me hear the charges against me. If I assaulted her, then why didn't she call the cops? She said she didn't want to hurt me with a family scandal. She didn't have any problem hitting me over the head and calling the police here last night. The reason she didn't scream because it never happened. You go right the screw ahead and believe who you want. But this marriage is over. Why would you want to live with the assaulter? No. You wanted to let Bob screw you and use me for an excuse? No, that's not true. I love you. You better look up the word love. It doesn't include screwing other men. I'm going to get a few of my things and I'll come back next week for more stuff while you're not home. I'll see a lawyer first thing Monday and get the divorce started. Ray, wait. This isn't how it was supposed to happen. Sandy said she forgave you, and you would forgive me. I was just getting even with you. No, you were just getting screwed by Bob and your sister. I went and grabbed a suitcase and put a few personal things in it. What am I to say to the kids? 
Tell them whatever the screw you want. Tell them I assaulted your sister and that you're a 304. I don't give a damn. I don't want to see you again. I'll set up visitation with the lawyer and Amy can pick up the kids for me to see. I don't ever want to talk to you again. I opened the door and walked out. Amy took me to a cheap motel until I could find somewhere else to go. I told Amy the whole story on my way to the motel. She was my sister and best friend. She knew I was telling the truth. I knew she would help keep an eye on Deb and the kids. The weeks passed and were really hard on me. I worked all the overtime I could since I had more expenses to pay. I found a cheap boarding house that I rented by the week. I ate most of my meals at the bar or the corner diner. I did see the lawyer and since I didn't have proof of anything, I just asked for a dissolution of our marriage. He told me that Debbie didn't want one but would go along with whatever I wanted. Everything was split pretty much 50-50. We were renting the house so she just took over the payment. Our savings were divided down the middle and she had to give me half the worth of our belongings. I had to pay child support which I really didn't mind. I love my kids and miss them terribly. The problem was I also missed Debbie but I knew we were finished. I went to whatever school functions I could that didn't interfere with my job. Both of our kids had birthday parties and I went to them as long as I didn't have to be around Debbie's family. I talked civilly to Deb, but whenever she wanted to talk about us, I walked away. I saw my kids every other weekend and once in a while during the week, depending on my work schedule. Deb must have called me almost every day following, right up to the divorce. If she wanted to talk about the kids or household things, I listened. When she wanted to talk about us, I hung up. I stopped by my sister's for dinner one day and played with my kids. Amy said that Sandy was still sticking by her story about me forcing sex on her. She told me Deb was really torn between what Sandy said and what I said. I tried to explain to Amy that I had no proof of anything and neither did Sandy. It was just my word against hers and Debbie believed her. That hurt more than anything. One afternoon while I was at my apartment my phone rang. It was the school. They told me that Cal wasn't feeling well and asked if I could pick him up. Of course I said yes and went and got him. He had a cold and was coughing. Debbie taught at the middle school, and I called her to let her know I was picking up Kyle. She said she would be home as soon as she could. I took Kyle home, laid him on his bed, and took his temperature. He had a slight fever, but nothing bad. About an hour later, Deb came home with Kayla. She went in quickly to see how Kyle was doing. While she went in to see him, the phone rang. I wasn't thinking when I answered it out of habit. It was Sandy. What are you doing there? She asked. Well, if it isn't the liar. Kyle was sick and I brought him home. Don't worry. You broke up this marriage. I reached down and pushed the record button on the answering machine. It was the type that would record both sides of a conversation. Is he alright? Why do you care? You broke his parents up. Why would you worry about him? Listen, Ray. It just got out of hand. You knew we were swingers and Bob wanted to try out my little sister. If you would have had sex with me like I asked, it never would have gotten out of hand. But, no. You come home and start fighting. You told Deb I sexually assaulted you. Then you have Bob pretty much sexually assaulted Deb. What the hell kind of sister are you? Bob never sexually assaulted her. She gave it willingly. Hell, she probably would again if Bob tried. She was drunk and you put all that shit into her head and then stood by while your husband screwed her. Problem is, Ray, you can't prove it. I told you from the beginning she would believe me over you and now you know. Anytime you need a sex, give me a call. Tell Deb to give me a call later. Hope my nephew gets to feeling better. She hung up and I turned off the recorder. Debbie asked who called and I told her, your wonderful angel of a sister who would never lie to you. What did she want? I recorded her message and she said to call her back. Well, I'll see you in court Thursday. I guess we can call it Freedom Day. Don't forget to listen to the message. I said as I went to my truck. After about five minutes, my cell phone began to ring over and over again. She must have called me ten times before I got home. When I got home my phone was ringing. I finally picked it up. Ray, I'm sorry, I'm so sorry, please forgive me. I just talked to Sandy and she told me the truth about not being sexually assaulted. Well, that's good to hear, but it doesn't change anything in my mind. You screwed Bob and didn't even give me a chance to explain. After I told you the truth. You still picked your sister's story thinking I was an assaulter. I have one thing to say to you. I loved you and probably always will, 
but I also hate you for what you did to our family and the distrust you have had in me. On Thursday, I took the next two days off work. I went to my lawyer's office and signed my name to the dissolution. I wanted to be gone before Deb came in. I was extremely depressed as I headed over to the neighborhood bar. I was putting the drinks away pretty good when I looked back and saw Bob come in. He didn't notice me as I came up to him from the side and cold cocked him. As he went down, I hit him again and again. I stood up and started kicking him until he was a mass lying there on the floor. I bent down to hit him some more when three guys pulled me off of him. I remembered saying, you son of a witch. I'll kill you for what you did to my family. I hope you die in hell, as I kept kicking him till I was pulled off of him. The police laid me on the floor and put handcuffs on me and led me to the squad car. This time I was taken to jail. I was allowed one phone call and I called my sister, Amy. I told her what I did and that she was not to post any bail money. It would be too expensive and I was going to serve my sentence. She cried as I hung up the phone. Debbie came to the jail to see me but I refused to see her. It was almost two months before my case went to court. I was charged with assault and pleaded guilty. I got two years minus time served. I told Amy to take my few belongings and store them in her basement for me. She told me that Debbie was really feeling badly and wanted to see me. I told her I didn't want to see her. I know you don't want to hear this but Deb really loves you. Her family is all mad at what Sandy said about you. Something else you should know. Debbie never showed up to sign the divorce decree. So you are going to prison a married man. I went to prison and it's not the kind of place you would want to live. It was like another world. I was getting in fights constantly. I had to prove myself to about every group there. I was nobody's patsy. My cellmate ended up being a lifer who went by the name of Killer. I guess he went home one day and saw his wife screwing another man and stabbed them both to death. According to the papers, Killer stabbed them upward of 80 times. He was a little hard to get to know. He had killed another inmate the year before after the inmate started a fight with him. I tried to keep to myself as much as possible, but other inmates had to keep trying me. I was put in the infirmary twice in the first two months for cuts. I had fights almost daily. I guess I paid my dues because I wasn't bothered quite as often after that. In fact, Killer even started to talk to me. On visitor's day, I decided to go see my visitor. I thought it would be Amy or my dad, but it was Debbie. What are you doing here? I asked. She looked so nice and pretty. I actually wished I could hug her, but I played the mean Ray. Ray, I love you and made a lot of mistakes. I brought you pictures from the kids. They miss you so much and so do I. Tears were streaming down her face. Look, I have another life now. Just take care of my kids and tell them I love them. She passed some pictures of the kids to me. It was their latest school pictures and they looked so cute. Ray, I didn't sign the divorce papers. I will wait for you. I don't care how long it takes. I made a terrible, terrible mistake, but I know we can get past it if you still love me. I didn't know what to say. Of course I felt I still loved her. I just hated what she did and not believing me. I stood up and walked back to my cell. I left her at the window and didn't look back. I worked in the kitchen and overheard some conversation about a guy going after Killer for killing his friend. They were going to try and corner him in the lunchroom the next evening. There was no one I could tell without being a snitch. I decided to tell Killer. That would make me part of his group. I didn't want to belong to any groups, but I couldn't let this man die the next day. Killer wasn't sure whether to believe me. I told him to believe what he wanted. I didn't tell the guards and was probably taking a big chance telling him. Killer looked me in the eye. He said you can tell a lot about a man when you stare him in the eyes. He told me to stay away from him the next day. He would control the situation without anyone knowing I told him about it. I couldn't believe what he did. He placed two thin, hard, covered books under his shirt covering his kidneys. He had three of his group sitting behind him at another table. When the prisoner came up behind him and put his arm around Killer's chest, he jabbed the knife into his kidneys, but of course hit the book. The shivs were usually pretty dull. They would penetrate skin, but not go completely through the book. Killer's friends grabbed the inmate and started beating him till the guards got to the table. The prisoner was taken to solitary and Killer sat back down to finish his dinner. I can't believe how calm he kept through the whole ordeal. After that day, Killer talked to me pretty regularly. When we talked in our cell, he was a different person than he was outside the cell. When outside the cell, he was as hard-nosed as possible. 
Everyone knew he was the leader of his group. He asked me about Debbie and the kids. He told me he had three grown-up kids of his own, but of course they never came to see him since he killed their mother. He told me his youngest daughter, Angie, was on his side. She knew her mother was the cause of the family's problems. She wrote to him regularly, but he told her not to come and visit. He didn't want other prisoners to see her and maybe put her in some kind of jeopardy. I could tell he really loved his daughter. He smiled when he told me she was a lawyer. I told him my whole miserable story about how Sandy set me up and also set up Debbie. Do you still love her? Killer asked me. Yes, I think so, but at the same time I hate what she did to our family. Does she still love you? She says she does, but I can't forgive her. Why not? Look where you are now. You've hit bottom, baby. If there was a woman out there who loved me and said she would wait for me, I'd be the happiest man alive. But what about the distrust and not believing me and screwing another man? Hell, you killed the man and your wife for the same thing. And I regret it every day of my life. I wish I would have given her a second chance and had my family back. Take it from me, Ray. Don't carry the grudge. It will kill you ever so slowly. Boy, did he give me something to think about. Was he right? What would I do when I got out? I had no job, no future and, right now, no family. The following month, I had a visitor again. Debbie came back. She smiled at me and had tears in her eyes. The kids drew you some more pictures. She put them in a tray and I looked at them. They were all pictures of a dad, mom and two kids. I guess the kids still saw us as a family. They miss you, Ray. God, I miss you. Will you ever be able to forgive me and we can be a family again? I promise, I'll do whatever it takes. I don't talk to Sandy or Bob anymore after what she did to us. I'm so sorry for not trusting you. I thought to myself, she didn't believe me once so the next time someone says something she'll probably believe them over me again. Deb, I've been doing a lot of thinking. I want to forgive you but I don't know if I can. Seeing you with Bob wasn't something I can get out of my mind. Did you really like him? No, I hated it. That's why I threw up. When you walked in, I saw the look on your face and I got sick. I knew I did the wrong thing to get even when I saw you. Of course I can never take it back. God, I wish I could. I would have never done it if I wasn't so drunk. There is only one man I want, and that's you, Ray, the father of our two kids. A couple of weeks later I had another visitor. Amy came to see me. Ray, remember I told you that Deb stopped seeing Sandy? I went by the house and I saw Sandy and Bob going into the house. I don't know why they were there so I kept on driving. I just thought you should know. Here I was confused again. Had Deb lied to me again? I was all ready to forgive her and try to make a life for us again. I know Amy wouldn't lie to me. I would have to find out why Deb would see Susan and Bob again. It was about a month later when Killer and I were talking and he told me he thought he owed me a favor for what I did for him. He said he was a lawyer before he was in prison and still had a few ties. He was going to see if he could get me out on an early release program. I didn't know whether to believe him, but he had never lied to me. It may seem odd to say this about a criminal, but I respected Killer. I often thought of what a good lawyer he must have been. His speech and stature demanded respect. I knew better than to ask any questions about his statement. I took him for his word. A few weeks later, I was called up to the warden's office and there was a parole board meeting going on. The warden spoke first. Mr. Harper, we have a petition for an early release hearing for you. I don't know who you know, but it was suggested we talk with you. After looking at your record, we see you had a rough time getting adjusted for the first few months. Is that correct? Yes, sir. I guess I wasn't cut out for prison life, but I tried to adjust. If you got out early, where would you live and how would you survive? I had to think quickly. I knew this was a make it or break it question. Well, sir, I have a sister who is also my best friend. She and her husband said that when I get released that I could live with them till I could get back on my feet. Aren't you married, Mr. Harper? Yes, sir, but we were in the process of a divorce when I was sentenced. As of right now, I'm not sure where we stand on the marriage issue. I'm just trying to be honest with you. We thank you for your honesty. We knew you were separated and wanted to see how truthful you were with us. Sir, as far as work goes, my previous employer said I was a good worker and to come see him when I get released. What are your chances of coming back to prison? It makes us look pretty bad when a convict that we release early comes back. 
I promise you, sir, that I never want to see the inside of these prison walls again. Go back to your cell, Mr. Harper, and we will get back to you by the end of the month. Yes, sir, and thank you for at least considering me for early release. I went back to my cell and Killer asked me how it went. I told him what I told the board and asked him if he had anything to do with it. You never know, but if you get released early, I'll expect a carton of cigarettes a week be put in my account. He laughed. Debbie was back a few days later and said that someone from the parole board was at the house. Are you getting an early release? She asked. What did they want? What did they say? I asked nervously how we got along and if you could live there. I told them that we were separated, but I would welcome you back, she said rather nervously. I changed the subject. You told me that you stopped seeing Sandy. Have you been seeing her? She's my sister. I don't see her as often. I cut her off. And Bob, have you seen him lately? Why are you asking me these questions? She really looked nervous. You can't be trusted. You told me you would not see Sandy, but yet she and Bob were at the house. Did you and Bob get it on again? Is that why you're worried about an early release? You tell your lover Bob that when I get out, I'm going to finish the job and if you're screwing him at the time, I'll take care of you too. Deb jumped up and ran out of the visitor's room. I knew that my thoughts were true. I was all ready to go back into the same damn situation that put me here in the first place. I didn't have any intention of killing anyone. I just wanted to put a big scare into them. I called my sister Amy and she came down to see me. I told her about the conversation with Deb, and she told me how sorry she felt for me. She did tell me the parole board came by her place, and she told them I was welcome to stay as long as needed. Her husband Kenny was there and mentioned that I was welcome there. Do you know if they called Mr. Parker about my job? Yes, they did and he said you could have your old job back. You were one of their best workers. God, Amy, you sure got my hopes up. I sure hope I don't get turned down. You won't. They told me since you have a place to stay and a job lined up, you'll probably be released the first of the month. She started crying. Amy was right. I got called up and told that I was being released the following week. I was given the name of an attorney who would be handling my case. I was to report to the agency first thing after I got released. I didn't understand why I would be seeing an attorney instead of a parole officer. I was told that the attorney's firm was the one that organized my release. They needed to see me and get my forms filed and would explain my parole situation to me, and then they would send me to the parole officer. I thanked Killer, and he reminded me of the cigarettes. I told him they would be there. To be honest, I don't know if he had anything to do with my early parole, but it was worth a carton of cigarettes a week just to be free. As I walked out the front gate, there stood my sister, Amy, crying. I gave her a hug and a light brotherly kiss. Welcome back, bro. I went to Amy's and her husband greeted me. I knew I was really welcome there. Of course I asked about Debbie, and Amy told me after I had talked to her at the prison that she contacted a lawyer and signed the final dissolution papers. I guess my thoughts about Deb were right, but now I was a free man. I knew I had to go see Deb and make arrangements to see my kids. I called over first to make sure she was home. I didn't want any big surprises and end up back in prison. I tried to explain to her that I was not coming over to cause trouble. We could even talk on the front porch. I just wanted to make arrangements to see my kids regularly. She agreed to see me, but she said she would call the police if I started any trouble. When I arrived at the house, my kids came running to me shouting, Daddy, Daddy, you're back? I grabbed them and hugged them. God, how I missed them. I talked to them for a few minutes and told them to ride their bikes and Mommy and me would sit on the porch and watch them. What do you want, Ray? You've made it perfectly clear that we will never be a family again. We are going on with our lives. Debbie, they are my kids too and I want them part of my life. I was all set to forgive you but you lied to me once again. You just had to go back with Bob and Sandy. I know what kind of people they are and the type of people they hang with. Ray, you were in prison and I got lonely. Don't give me that shit. I know you've been screwing around. I don't give a shit who you screw anymore. Take Bob up your bum if you haven't already. I'm here to tell you that if I find out that my kids are exposed to that perverse lifestyle that I will do everything humanly possible to take them from you. Do you understand? This isn't just some idle threat. My kids mean a lot to me, and I want them to have a good life. Ray, I would never do anything to hurt my kids. You already have. You broke up our family over Bob. I will keep an eye out to make sure my kids are kept away from such people. 
I'll be seeing my new lawyer tomorrow and find out what my rights are. I don't trust or believe you anymore. You've showed me your true stripes. I'm over you, but we have two kids to raise, and I'm going to make sure they are raised in a good environment. I promise you, Ray, that I won't be drawn into that lifestyle. Yes, I tried it. I'll admit it, but it's not for me or my kids. You'll see. I'm a changed woman. I don't trust you and remember. Actions speak louder than words. My kids came up and I talked to them about school and what all they've been doing. I told them that I was living with Aunt Amy, but I would be finding a place closer and would be spending more time with them. I kissed and hugged them goodbye and headed back to Amy's. The next morning I headed to the law firm that represented me. It felt kind of odd going there. I hadn't even talked to the lawyer that got me an early release. I walked up to the receptionist and pulled out the card I was given by the parole board. May I speak to Mr. A.J. Brady, please? I have an appointment. I'm Ray Harper. The receptionist smiled at me. Ms. Brady will see you shortly. Please be seated, Mr. Harper. I asked myself if she said Ms. Brady. The card said, A.J. Brady. So I just assumed it was a man. I was sitting there wondering when a beautiful woman approached me in a navy blue dress suit. She had a smile and dimples and dark shoulder-length brunette hair. I couldn't help staring at her as she reached out her hand to greet me. Ray Harper, I presume, she said, as she held out her hand to shake mine. I'm A.J. Brady. I know we haven't met, but I was asked to look at your, should I say, situation, and found you didn't have a fair defense, and the rest we will talk about. Will you please follow me into my office? Mary, I don't want to be disturbed. Please take messages on any calls I get, and tell them I'll get back to them. Yes, Ms. Brady replied the receptionist. I followed her into her office. I would have followed her over a cliff if she would have asked. She was one good-looking woman. Well, Mr. Harper, we finally meet. Please call me Ray, if you don't mind. I owe you my life, and I don't have any idea why you did it. Mr. Harper. I mean Ray. A good friend of mine asked me to look into your case. Your lawyer let you plead guilty instead of trying to help you out. You had a lot, if mitigating circumstances, that he never brought up. You had just signed your divorce papers. The man who was part of the cause of your divorce came into the place where you were. You weren't really of sound mind at the time. These factors and others would have gotten you a lesser sentence. Granted, you did the assault, but your sentence was too harsh. I pointed this out to the parole board, and they somewhat agreed with me. I asked, Why? Miss Brady? Why me? Who asked you to help me? Can I call you something other than Ms. Brady? After all I feel you saved my life and gave me my life back. Look Ray, I was asked to help you and I did. Is it that important that you know who hired me? As far as my name goes, I guess you can call me AJ. I befriended a man in prison. They called him Killer. He told me he would help me get an early release. He also told me he had a daughter he loved named Angie and that she was a lawyer. I was wondering if that beautiful daughter he talked about was you. My new lawyer eyes were glistering. She looked at me eye to eye and said, Yes, killer. I mean, Dave. My father's name is Dave, and he asked me to look into your case. He has never asked me to do that before, so he must have really liked you. I was surprised when he asked, but I would do anything for my father. AJ, can I call you Angie? I know we just met and you were my lawyer, but you were way too pretty for me to call you AJ, and I sure don't want to call you Miss Brady. What does AJ stand for anyway? Angelina Juanita Brady is the name I go by. Now you know why I chose AJ. Look, Ray, we have a number of things we need to talk over. Would you have lunch with me? I asked. Ray, I don't date clients. This isn't a date, it's lunch. I have to go to work in a couple of hours, and I need to eat. If you don't want to call it a date, then you can pay for it and call it a business meeting. You do take clients to lunch once in a while, don't you? Angie was smiling and her big dimples were showing. No wonder dad liked you. Yes, I do take clients to lunch and I do eat. Let me tell Mary we will be leaving and then we can go to lunch. I watched her get up. She was a very nice looking woman. She had looks and a personality. That was something you don't often find in an attorney. We headed out to lunch and went to a really nice quiet restaurant. After ordering lunch, she explained to me about seeing my parole officer. She told me he was a pretty decent guy, but I would have to follow the rules and not to get into trouble. I was to meet with him twice a month for a couple of months, and then once a month for the rest of the year. Angie, you know everything there is about me. Are you going to tell me anything about yourself? 
Ray, I don't think it would be appropriate to talk to you about my personal life. You're the most beautiful woman I have ever seen and I love to see your dimples when you smile. Ray, please, I told you I don't date clients, but thank you for the compliments. She couldn't help turning a bit red. Tell me about your law degree, that's business. I have a right to know that as a client. She was trying to hold back a smile. Okay, Ray, I have a law degree that I received from the university on a scholarship. I've been an attorney for a few years now. My specialty is in criminal law. Our lunch arrived, and we began eating. I couldn't help myself. My thoughts were all about Angie. Will I see you again, Angie? As a matter of fact, you have to come back next week to fill out the papers that you get from your parole officer. Can we do lunch again? I'll even buy. I could tell she was softening up a little. Okay, but it's a lunch to discuss business only. She couldn't help smiling. After lunch, we went back to the office. When she held out her hand to say goodbye, I just held hers in both of my hands for a few seconds. I had to wonder what she was thinking. I hoped she wasn't thinking I was some kind of cook. We said our goodbyes, and I told her I was already looking forward to lunch next week. Her receptionist glanced at her and smiled. I guess clients didn't approach their lawyers like this too often. But again, most lawyers didn't look like Angie. I started back to work, and it really felt great. In no time at all, I was doing my job. I guess it's like riding a bike. Just get back on and start riding. Most of the guys I used to work with were still there. It's as though they had a newfound respect for me. No one messed with me. The next two Mondays in a row, I had an appointment with Angie. She tried to keep it business, but I wanted to know more about her. The fourth week we were together, she told me we were done with our business transactions. Are you still my attorney? I asked. Why, of course, if you ever have a problem, all you need to do is call me, she said. Angie, I'm afraid I have to fire you. I'm so sorry. What? Fire me. In God's name, what has gotten into you? I helped you get out of prison and I haven't charged you anything and you want to fire me? Yes, you said you won't date your clients and I want a real date with you. I want to take you out for a real dinner and maybe dancing. I want to really get to know you. I know I'm an ex-con and a factory worker, but I want to get to know you better. I think you feel the same about me too because the last three weeks I could have phoned in the information you asked for. I think you want to see me also. Ray, I'm sorry, I don't know what to say. Yes. I'm slightly attracted to you, but it's the ex-con and the factory worker thing, isn't it? You don't think we should be together. No, no, that's not it at all. You are my client. I'm your attorney. What will people think? Who cares? Just go out with me once. If you don't have a good time, then you'll know not to go again. Follow your heart. Go out with me Saturday night. Look, I know I'm freshly out of prison and have been locked up for a while. I don't know where this is going, but I'm willing to give it a chance. Oh God, I know I shouldn't do this, but I'll go once. I'll tell you right now, don't try to get me to sleep with you. Oh God, I can't believe I said that, replied Angie. We went out that Saturday. I borrowed my sister's car. I didn't want to take Angie out in my old truck. She had given me her address, and it was a townhouse. I knocked on her door, and when she answered I saw the most gorgeous woman. I know all men see women differently. In my eyes she looked stunning, yet pretty. I wanted to grab her and hold her right then and there. I knew I had to be a gentleman but it was going to be hard. We went to a fancy restaurant and ordered wine and then dinner. We decided to talk a little after dinner while listening to the music. Angie, tell me about yourself. Where did you grow up? You must have been married because your last name is different than your dad's. Please tell me about yourself. You know my life like a book. Ray, my dad and mom didn't get along really well. Of course, you know the outcome. Dad's been in prison for 14 years now. My brother and sister and I were raised by our aunts and uncles. I'm the youngest and I was 14 when all this took place. It was really hard on all of us. My brother and sister haven't really forgiven dad. They love him, but they just can't forgive him. I knew mom was cheating on him and I told him about it. I confronted mom but she told me I was just a kid and didn't know what I was talking about. She told me someday I might really learn about life. That's when I mentioned it to dad. Two weeks later is when he caught her with another man. I partially blame myself. If I would have kept quiet then it might not have happened. Angie, you don't know that. You aren't responsible for your mom's death or your dad's incarceration. They were adults and you were a kid trying to do the right thing. 
After dad was incarcerated, I decided I was going to go to college and try and become a lawyer and maybe I could help my dad get a lighter sentence. It's the reason I chose criminal law. Of course, there wasn't much wiggle room in dad's case. He was a brilliant lawyer himself and told me how proud he was of me, but there wasn't much I could do to help him. Were you married before or is it none of my business? I asked Angie. Both. I was married for a short time and it isn't any of your business. She smiled at me when she told me that. Ray, can we talk about this another time? I don't want to put a downer on this evening. I'm having a nice time with you. Would you like to dance? I have two left feet, but it will give me a chance to hold you. We got up and I asked the band if they would play a few slow numbers in a row. I took Angie in my arms and we danced. I held her close and smelled the scent in her hair. Ray, you should know that I don't date much. Because of the people I deal with, I have a rather large distrust of men. I'm just trying to be honest with you. If my dad wouldn't have sent you to me, I probably wouldn't be here tonight. I'm going to send your dad an extra carton of cigarettes. Angie, you're the nicest thing that has ever come my way. I'll do whatever it takes to get you to trust me. If I overstep my bounds, just tell me and I'll pull back. When I took her home that night, I kissed her at the door. Afterwards, she just stared at me. She leaned forward and kissed me again. Can I come in, Angie? No, Ray, too fast, too soon. Not tonight. Will you see me again, say next Saturday? That might be a possibility. Call me around Thursday. I went home a very happy man. We did go out the following Saturday and the Saturday after that. She told me more about herself. Ray, I want you to know more about me if we are going to keep seeing each other. I'm not going to hide anything from you. I'm not made that way. As I told you, I was married before. It was during my first year of college. This guy and I thought we loved each other and of course made love. I got pregnant and we decided to get married. We got a justice of the peace and he married us. We soon both knew that our marriage wasn't working out. We were too young. I had a miscarriage and my husband and I talked it over and knew we had made a mistake and got a divorce. I kept the last name Brady because my dad said I should, so it would distance me from his last name of Miller. Of course that was my maiden name. I felt so good that she was finally confiding in me. She asked me about my kids and I told her that they wanted to meet her. I mentioned that I had talked about her to them and my daughter kept asking to meet her. Angie, would you like to meet my sister and my two kids? We are having a family barbecue and you're invited. It will be a week from Saturday. I knew this would be a giant step for us if she agreed to come. Meeting my family was the first step in us becoming closer. She was looking everywhere but at me. I knew she knew this was a big step. She took a very deep breath and then looked me in the eyes. She then leaned forward and kissed me. This was the first time she had ever kissed me first like this. As she backed away, she took another deep breath. Okay, Ray, count me in. What do you want me to bring? I had no idea what women did at these cookouts. I told her I would have Amy call her. When I told Amy about Angie coming to the family cookout, the number of family members who were coming to the cookout increased. They all wanted to meet the new lady in my life. My mom and dad were coming as well as some cousins and aunts and uncles. Angie did say she would make potato salad. I remember Amy telling me how sweet Angie sounded when she called her. I think she was hoping that something might happen between us. I knew I did. I stopped by Deb's house every other weekend to pick up my kids. I would take them over to Amy's, or we would go out somewhere. It was fun being with them. I did question them about their mother, but always tried to do it in a nice way. Kyle told me that their mom had gone out with a man. It bothered me at first until Kayla told me it was a school teacher. His name was Pat, and he taught health class and was a soccer coach. I did ask Deb about him and she said, I told you I'm trying to turn my life around. Pat's a nice guy. His wife died of leukemia two years ago. He moved here to start over. He has a 15-year-old daughter and Kyle and Kayla like her. One thing I want to tell you, Deb, you're lying and cheating ruined it between us. If you care for this man, treat him right and above all be honest with him. Don't mess it up like you did between us. Pat likes our kids and treats them good. He knows about you and understands that you're their father. I hope it works out for us. I hope I didn't ruin it for you and all women. You are a good man, Ray, and I know you'll find the right woman. I'm just sorry for all the hurt I caused you. I said my goodbyes and drove home. I had found a small apartment about a mile from where Deb and the kids live. 
I found one with two bedrooms so the kids would have a place to stay when they are with me. I still stop by Amy's a couple of times a week, usually to eat, but I like visiting with them also. When the day of the barbecue came, I was a nervous mess. I was standing out in the street waiting for Angie to show up. I felt so relieved when her car pulled up. She smiled at me and handed me a bowl. Potato salad and you better eat some, she smiled at me. She looked beautiful. I don't think she could look bad in my eyes. I just felt so good when I was around her. I knew I was falling in love with her, even though we never did any more than kiss. Some things you just know. I was just hoping she had some feelings for me too. I introduced her to everyone as a good friend of mine. When I introduced her to mom and dad, she smiled and gave them each a hug. Dad said right in front of her, Don't let this one go, Ray. We already love her and don't even know her. Angie looked at me and just smiled. I took that as a positive feedback. When I introduced her to Amy, they both looked at me. Ray, I never told you but I met your sister when I was interviewing people for your early release. I didn't tell you because the subject never came up till now. I had no idea that we would become friends. I told you I would never lie to you. That's why I'm telling you now. Amy and I have not talked since the parole interview until she called me about the potato salad. Is there anyone else you talk to that I should know about? Yes, Deb, your ex-wife, Sue, and of course, Bob. I did talk to your boss at work to make sure you would have a job. The people who witnessed the bar fight and, of course, the police who arrested you. I did it all in the capacity of being your attorney. I had no idea that I would be falling for you. After all, I had never met you. I'm sorry for not disclosing all this to you, but I really wasn't supposed to tell you all this. You were my client and I needed to find out the truth before I could be behind you. If you want me to leave, please tell me and I will go. Go? Leave? You just told me that you were falling for me. That's all I heard. I grabbed her and kissed her, then put my arm around her and introduced her to the rest of the family. I told Angie that I would be back in a few minutes. I had to go get my kids. They were dying to meet her. When I got back, Kayla walked up and introduced herself to Angie. Hi there. I am Kayla. Are you daddy's girlfriend? You sure are pretty, just like daddy said. Hello, Kayla. You can call me Angie or AJ. You are a very pretty girl yourself. It's so nice to meet you. Kayla said, come over and meet my big brother. He's 10 and afraid of girls. Kyle, this is AJ, daddy's friend. I watched Kyle shake Angie's hand. She knelt down so she could talk to the kids on their level. I could tell by the three of them talking that they were going to be friends. I went over and joined them. We like her, daddy. She's so pretty and nice. Kyle, who wasn't exactly a talker, said to me. Again, Angie just looked at me and smiled. The barbecue was great. Toward the end of the evening, I was talking with Angie when Kyle and Kayla came up to us. Dad, you know how you said we were going to the amusement park in two weeks? Can Angie come with us? That way when me and Kayla are riding rides you will have someone to talk to. I tried to explain to Kyle that he should ask stuff like that in private. Maybe Angie had other plans or doesn't like amusement parks. He looked at Angie and apologized to her. I'm sorry Angie. I didn't know you didn't like amusement parks. Angie started to laugh. She knelt down and said to Kyle. Honey, what your dad means is that you should ask him questions like that in private before asking me. As far as amusement parks go, I love them and I would love to go if it's alright with your dad. Maybe you and I can ride the roller coaster together. Needless to say, we all went to the amusement park and the kids rode everything they could. Angie kept her promise to Kyle and rode the roller coaster with him. She also rode the Ferris wheel with Kayla. On the way home, Kayla said to me, Dad, you have to buy a car instead of your truck. You can't expect Angie to use her car all the time because we can't all fit in your truck. It made both Angie and me start laughing, but the girl did have a point. I didn't get to see much of Angie in the next couple of weeks. I had to work a couple of weekends, and she was busy in court. We did talk a couple of times on the phone, but it just wasn't the same. I picked up the kids one Saturday, and we decided to go to Chuck E. Cheese. It was a pizza joint for kids. Besides the pizza, they had all kind of games where you win tokens and get little prizes. We were at the house when Kayla asked me if she could call Angie and ask her to come with us. I didn't want to disappoint her so I said I would give Angie a call. I called, Angie, it's Ray. Kayla asked me to give you a call. What are you doing this evening? Oh, hi, Ray. I was going out with a few friends. Why? Nothing. Have a nice time. Ray, 
You said Kayla wanted to ask me something. Please hand her the phone. It's nothing, Angie. Yes, it's something. Please hand Kayla the phone. I could only hear one side of the conversation. Hello, Angie. Dad is going to take me and Kyle to Chuck E. Cheese for pizza and games. We wanted to know if you wanted to come with us. Yeah, okay. I'll tell him. We miss you too. Okay, bye. I felt sorry for Kayla. I'm sorry, honey, but she already had plans. What do you mean, Daddy? She said she would be here in half an hour. She told me to tell you about getting a car so she doesn't have to use her car all the time. Oh, yeah, Dad. She said she misses us. That evening after we got back from the pizza place, where the kids each won half a dozen stuffed animals thanks to Angie and her game skills, I dropped the kids off at their mom's house. Angie told me it was about time we got to know each other more intimately. We went to my apartment and sat on the couch. Angie, you do know that I love you, don't you? I wouldn't be here right now if I thought anything else. I want you to make love to me. It's been a long time since I trusted any man. All I ask is that you be caring and gentle. I don't want to be used. I want to be made love to. We started on the couch and made our way into the bedroom. We did everything we wanted for me, massaging her feet to licking whipped cream off her belly and everything in between. We spent half the night caressing, massaging, and making love. I actually felt best when I could hold her after making love to her. It was so nice to cuddle and hold her close. It had been so long since I had done that. She ended up spending the whole night. I got up before her and made us some French toast. She came out of the bedroom in one of my t-shirts. That shirt never had it so good, I said to her. I couldn't believe she looked great even in the morning. She took a quick shower and we sat down and talked. Angie, what's next for us? You know I love you, and my kids love you, and all my family loves you. What do you want to happen next, Ray? There I go talking like a lawyer. We've only known each other for a few months and made love for the first time last night. I know it's only been a few months, but I want you in my life every day. If we haven't made love enough, we can go back in the bedroom and spend the day there. Angie had to smile at that remark. Angie, I want you to be my wife. Will you marry me? Angie had tears in her eyes. Ray, so you know, I don't take love lightly. I made a mistake once like I told you. Yes, I'll marry you. I want you to know that I will always be there for you and the kids. I know what you went through in your first marriage. I will always be honest with you and will never cheat on you. I will expect the same from you. She came to me and kissed me very passionately. Honey, what's the matter? You look happy but yet sad, I asked her. It's my thoughts about my dad and how happy I think he'll be. Most young girls think about that special wedding day. How they would dress in their white gown and be walked down the aisle by their father and given to their husband. I know that will never happen with me, and it makes me sad. She was crying lightly. My dad didn't even know that I was getting married last time. By the time I had written to him I had a miscarriage and was on my way to a divorce. I'm sorry Ray, I shouldn't be thinking about that now. After all, I'll be marrying a man my dad approves of and whom I've been in love with since I first met him. What? You loved me from the beginning. I wanted you from the first time I saw you, but I know you knew that. She gave me a sweet smile and asked me when I wanted to tie the knot. I told her that any arrangements would be on her terms. We both agreed it would be as soon as possible. I asked her if I could start telling everyone, and she told me she was going to sew all we needed was the date. We decided it would be in two months. I was on cloud nine for the next few days. I told Amy and her husband Kenny. They were both very happy for us. I had to tell the kids. I called over to their house and had them both get on extensions so I could tell them at the same time. They were both screaming how happy they were and how much they liked Angie. I told them it would be in a couple of months, but I wanted them to be one of the first people I told. I stopped at Angie's office and Mary, her receptionist, congratulated me. She told me that Angie was telling everyone and invited them all to the wedding reception. She rang Angie and told me to go on in. Angie was waiting for me. When I went in, Angie was crying lightly. What's the matter, Angie? I called the prison and talked to the prison warden and asked him if my dad could get a one-day leave to attend our wedding. He told me that dad wasn't allowed to leave the prison under any circumstances. His life imprisonment meant just that. He did tell me it was out of his hands and there was nothing he could do. I'm so sorry, Angie. I know having your father there would have meant a lot to you. It gets worse, Ray. 
Dad has cancer although it has been in remission, but is now back. They give him three to six months to live. She started crying and I held her to my chest. I thought, why God? Why do this to her? She was a good person and I really hurt for her. Angie, I've been buying your father's cigarettes since I have been released. It was a deal I made with him. I'm so sorry. It's not your fault. Dad doesn't smoke anymore. He uses the packs of cigarettes that people send him to barter with the other prisoners. You haven't contributed to his cancer. I had an idea but I didn't want to tell Angie and get her hopes up. I kissed her goodbye and told her I would see her the next day. I called off work for the next day and went to the prison to see Killer and the warden. When Killer saw me he smiled. You take good care of my little girl, Ray. All I ask is that you make her happy. She deserves a lot better out of life than what she's received. I explained my idea to Killer and at first he said, no, but finally agreed to go along if I could get the warden to agree. So I told him I would see him later. I had an appointment with the warden. The warden greeted me. Well, Ray, I see you are keeping your nose clean and getting married. I'm sorry about Killer, but he's a lifer and we can't let him out to go to his daughter wedding. Warden, are you in total charge of the prison and allowed to make most decisions about the facilities? What are you getting at, Ray? Can we get married on the premises? Could we use the chapel and Killer can escort his daughter down the aisle? You and Killer's daughter want to get married here? In prison? Just so her dad can be there? Is that what you are asking? Yes, sir. She hasn't seen her dad in over 14 years and he's dying as you know. All we ask is for use of the chapel to get married. I know prisoners have been married here before. Okay, Ray. I'll set it up at this end. This can't be a big affair. You can only invite three outsiders into the prison besides you and your fiancé. I will let Killer invite a few of his fellow prisoners. You will have to use the prison minister. I thanked the warden and headed back up to see Killer. Dave, Killer laughed when I called him by his name. The warden agreed to go along with my idea. I'm heading back to tell Angie now. Thank you, Dave. I know this means a lot to our girl. Dave smiled at me. Ray, copy down this number I'm going to give you. It was something I put back for Angie. When you go to the bank, tell Angie to take her birth certificate. The account is in her maiden name. I took down the information and told Dave I was sorry to hear about his illness. Just take care of my little girl, that's all I ask, replied Dave. I went back to Angie's office. She saw the smile on my face and asked me what was up. Do you mind getting married in prison? I asked. What? What are you talking about, Ray? I explained to her about my talk to the warden and that her dad would be allowed to walk her down the aisle. She started crying big happy tears. God, I love you, Ray. I told her about the bank deposit box and we went over to see what was in it. I'm Angelina Juanita Miller and I would like to see my safe deposit box. Angie gave him her number, and he looked at her birth certificate. He led us back to the safe deposit boxes and opened it for us and left the room. The first thing that we noticed was a note from her father. Dear Angie, if you're opening this box, you are either getting married or I have passed on. I hope it's the first thing. The little box contains your mother's wedding ring. I know everyone wondered where it went, but I put it in here for safekeeping. I want you to have it and wear it proudly. Your mother had her faults but loved you, and I know she would have wanted you to have her wedding ring. Also, there are bonds totaling over $15,000 to help pay for your wedding. I set this up before I was sent away. When you see your brother and sister, tell them there is a box for each of them too, if they haven't already got theirs. Yours is the only one containing a ring. Congratulations, and always be honest to your husband. With love, Dad. Angie and I talked about our wedding. We decided to invite her brother Brad and sister Lisa if they would come. Also, my sister Amy. We would invite family and friends to our reception which would take place shortly after the wedding. Angie and Amy spent the next month getting everything set up for the reception. We had to pay extra for everything since it was such short notice, but I wanted Angie to have as much of her dream as possible. Amy said she would use her digital camera and take pictures. Angie and I went to see her brother and sister. She introduced me to them. They told me that they didn't hate their dad. They hated what he did. Angie explained the wedding to them and why she was holding it at the prison. Both Brad and Lisa had tears in their eyes when they found out their dad was dying. After they agreed to go to the wedding, Angie gave them the numbers to their safe deposit boxes. They were surprised that their father had set something aside for them. 
On the day of the wedding Angie and I rode to the prison together. Amy and her husband came but her husband waited in the car for her. As we entered I had a suit for killer to wear. One of the guards took it to him. I had on my tux which I rented for the occasion. Amy went in a room with Angie to help her with her wedding dress. Angie didn't want me to see her until she entered the chapel. I entered the chapel to wait for Angie. And came Brad and Lisa. Brad was going to be my best man and Lisa was Angie's maid of honor. There was a small piano in the chapel and an inmate was playing some songs on it. A guard brought five other inmates who were friends of killers, Dave, in, and seated them. The warden came in with a minister and smiled. He walked up to me and said that they had some cake and punch for everyone after the ceremony. For a warden, he wasn't such a bad guy. The pianist started playing Here Comes the Bride, and everyone stood. And through the door came Angie on the arm of her father. Both had tears coming down their cheeks. Angie had gotten her wish, being escorted by her father down the aisle on her wedding day. When they arrived in front of the chapel, everyone sat down except our small wedding party. Another guard came in and closed the door. The minister intoned, Who gives this woman to this man? I do, sir, replied Dave proudly and he sat down. Angelina Juanita Miller Brady, do you take Raymond Michael Harper to be your husband? The minister continued his statement and then asked me the same question. We made sure that he said, to love and honor from this day forward. It's how we both felt. No one would ever come between us. We both had rocky lives up to this point. We knew we would do our best to make our marriage work. After we said our vows, I kissed the bride. She then turned around and kissed and hugged her father. We all headed to an adjoining room to talk for a few minutes and have some cake and punch supplied by the warden. Brad and Lisa both walked up to their dad and gave him a hug. It's the first time they spoke or talked to him in almost 15 years. There was a lot of crying going on. Tears of joy and tears of remorse. They knew their father was dying and they wanted him to know they still loved him. Amy had taken pictures of Angie and me throughout the short service. She also took as many pictures as she could of Dave with his three kids. She recorded the crying, hugging, and even the little bit of laughter they all shared in that short span of time. She left and she and her husband took the pictures to a 24-hour photo center and had all the pictures developed and some enlarged. We said our goodbyes to Dave and the warden. We thanked him for making Angie's dream come true. As we left we noticed that Brad and Lisa were still talking to their dad. It was a wonderful sight to see. We headed back to town and to our reception. Everyone we invited attended. The first two people we saw were Kyle and Kayla jumping up and down as we got out of the car. They ran up to us and hugged us. We entered the hall and were greeted with shouts of joy. My parents were there with tears in their eyes, along with most everyone who greeted us. A lot of Angie's friends were there to greet us. Most of them I had never met. I did notice Mary as she came over and gave us a hug. About a half hour later Amy showed up with the photos. She had a couple of our photos enlarged. She sat them all on the table for everyone to see. Brad and Lisa had stopped at home to pick up their families. Brad was with his wife and two kids. Lisa was with her husband and three kids. The two families walked up to a photo of Dave and told the kids that it was their grandfather. Amy told them that she had made four sets of photos and after the reception that each family could take a set home. There was one each for Brad and Lisa, one for Angie and me, and of course one for Amy. I wanted to tell you how incredible Angie looked in her wedding dress. If she had wings, she would have looked like an angel that God sent down. To me, she was the most beautiful woman I have ever seen and she was my wife. I guess most men feel that way about their wife. We danced and ate and danced some more. With the clanging of the glasses our lips were together most of the night. The people I worked with told me I was a very lucky man. Believe me, I didn't have to be told. I knew that I got the brass ring and intended on holding on to it forever. For those who are wondering, Deb and Pat did not come to our wedding. This was Angie's day, and I didn't want anything to spoil it. Seeing her with her father walking down the aisle, watching her brother and sister making amends with their father, a family coming back together. No way would I ever forget this day. It's been six months since our wedding day. Debbie and Pat got married last month. I was glad to see that she was really trying to establish a life for herself. My kids tell me that Pat treats them good. I asked about Aunt Sue and Uncle Bob and my kids said they moved away to another state. 
I got a transfer today shift so I could see my kids more often and be home with Angie every evening. She was pregnant with our child. It was three months to the day after our wedding that Dave Killer passed away. His kids went to visit him each month till his passing. It was sad, but we did get a chance to tell him about Angie's pregnancy. We told him it was going to be a boy, and we were naming him David Raymond. It brought a smile to Dave's face. I look back over all that has happened. A cheating wife, going to prison, meeting the woman of my dreams, and then marrying her. Now I was starting over and going to be a father again. There is not a day that goes by when I don't thank God for what I have. I thank Him for giving me and Angie another chance at happiness. Dear listeners, please share your thoughts in the comments section below and don't forget to like, share, and subscribe.